Welcome to the White House, and thank you all for coming from, uh, from around the country. We very much appreciate it. My name is Kareem Dale, and I am Special Assistant to the President for Disability Policy here at the White House. I work out of the Office of Public Engagement and the Domestic Policy Council, where I coordinate the administration's work on disability policy. And so welcome to you all in the room to our community leaders briefing, the 25th, which is like an important number. So you can like, it's like a milestone. We've been doing these since June 2011. And welcome to all of you all who are watching on the uh, live stream feed on whitehouse.gov. We appreciate you all joining and wish you all could be here with us. But um, we've got a great group here. We've got the, the ARC. And so I want to thank the entire ARC team. <laughs> Thank Peter Burns, who's uh, been a great partner, Marty Ford, Julie, and the entire ARC uh, team here in D.C., and then, of course, all of you all uh, from around the country. We're very, very excited. The first piece of business that I should do, and I think she actually may have just left, but first piece of business I should do, the most important thing you may hear today, is I want to certainly acknowledge and thank uh, my team and the leader of my team in making this event happen, because really I just showed up here today. I really didn't do anything <laughs> to make this happen. Uh, Sarah Feuerstein, who you all probably heard Marty talk about and Peter talk about, uh, because she did all the work. So uh, let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> and there were a bunch of other uh, folks, interns, who helped out, so we appreciate everybody's work. Um, I am just going to go through a couple of the logistics. I'll be back a little bit later to talk to you more uh, about substance, but let me just walk you through the agenda uh, for this morning. The, we're going to have the first speaker coming up is going to be Carol Galant Galante from uh, HUD, and then we're going to have Cecilia Munoz, who is the director of the Domestic Policy Council. Uh, we'll have, I'll be back after Cecilia, talk to you for a few minutes about some employment issues and our, this briefing and some other White House uh, tools that you all can utilize. We'll take a break. Uh, then we'll have Robert Gordon from the Office of Management and Budget, and we'll have Tom Perez from the Department of Justice. So it's a great morning, and then, of course, you all will uh, depart for the folks in the room will depart for the East Wing tour. Um, and we'll have folks shepherd everybody over there for the East Wing tour. Then you'll come back here um, in the next, the afternoon part will not be uh, live stream for those watching on the internet. Uh, but you all will come back to the, and go over to the White House Conference Center for breakout sessions, uh, four different breakout sessions, which I assume everybody has talked to you all about which ones you want to go to. We've got uh, community, lead, uh, community living and we've got folks from uh, HHS and Department of Justice who will be leading that. We've got a session on Medicaid, which uh, our senior, one of our senior policy advisors on the health care team will be leading that. We've got education. We've got the assistant secretary of OSERS and also the head of policy at the Department of Education will be uh, leading that one. And then we've got um, family caregiving and we have um, Kathy Greenlee from um, HHS uh, who's over the uh, Old Americans office at HHS. She will be leading that. So you've got a great lineup, a great time to dialogue. Uh, some of the speakers will not be able to take questions today in terms of this morning session. Uh, most of them will, though, so I encourage you all to uh, have a dialogue because this is about a dialogue. This is just not about us talking to you, but it's about a dialogue. Um, so most of the speakers will be able to take questions. So we're excited. We're looking forward to the day. We hope you all are looking forward to the day. We hope that it's beneficial for you all. We hope that it's beneficial for those uh, watching on the internet uh, around the country this morning session. And with that, let me stop chattering. And uh, does anybody have any questions before we hit to the first speaker about any of the logistics or anything? Anything, anything, anything? Okay, all right. Well, let me get to the first speaker. Our first speaker is the Acting Assistant Secretary um, at FHA and HUD, um, Carol Galante, who's been a great partner to the White House and working on many different housing initiatives, improving, improving housing uh, for folks with disabilities. And Carol and I uh, have worked closely on a number of, di of different efforts, so we thank her for joining. Uh, please welcome Carol. Thank you all. Thank you for inviting me here today. Thank you for 
getting up however early you all got up to look so spiffed up and uh, here in the room. Uh, and, and, and I have to say I was a little skeptical that um, we'd really get started on uh, uh, speeches and activity at 8 a.m. in the morning. So I am, uh, I am I'm very, very impressed. Uh, and uh, thank you, Kareem, for the introduction and for uh, inviting me here because I just love coming to um, events like this where uh, we get to talk about uh, with partners uh, the work we're doing at HUD and how that aligns uh, with the work uh, that you do. And um, in this situation, I just want to uh, say that HUD, under the Obama administration, has taken uh, very seriously um, a goal that we add it to our strategic uh, plan under this administration, which is utilizing housing as a platform for improving the quality of life. And I think that really helps us set our agenda and I think aligns uh, very well with the agenda uh, of ARC. And I'd like to uh, talk uh, just a little bit about um, some of that uh, today. You know, the core idea here is that that uh, a home of one's own, whether you own it or whether you rent it, uh, is the cornerstone of independence for people uh, with uh, disabilities. But we all know that this is uh, not always an easy uh, uh, dream to, to realize and that people with disabilities can experience some significant uh, barriers to both obtaining and maintaining um, their housing. But HUD is fully committed uh, to doing whatever it takes to resolve uh, discrimination, access to services, and um, providing housing affordability uh, to enable that long-term uh, self-sufficiency. And that's why um, we place such a high importance on a program I want to talk a little bit about today, uh, the Section 811 program. And I just want to ask how many people here by a raise of hands, and I'm sorry those in the uh, uh, internet can't raise their hands, but uh, are aware of the Section 811 program at HUD, either you know, uh, live in Section 811 housing or have family members or work or provide services to or anything. Who, who has some experience? Yeah, great, that is fabulous, thank you. Um, so for over 20 years, uh, this program um, has provided um, housing for persons with disabilities and ab about 30,000 households um, across the country are um, living in housing that is supported through the Section 811 uh, program. And it really, uh, for all that it does, it really allows very deeply affordable uh, rent levels, which uh, not all uh, quote, affordable housing programs provide such a deep uh, affordability level uh, for persons and families. And um, it, it just uh, it has been a great program. And I'm going to give you just a couple of examples and then shift and talk about some of the new uh, modernization of that program. Because while some things work, um, it doesn't mean they can't work better. Uh, and it doesn't mean that we all haven't evolved in the way we see the provision of housing and, and services. And I think the Section 811 program is a great example of um, our commitment at HUD to evolving as the community of practice um, has also evolved in terms of the best ways to um, provide uh, affordable housing for uh, people with disabilities. But I just want to mention two very innovative um, examples of the 811 program. One is a ribbon cutting we're about to have across the river in Arlington, Virginia next week where Volunteers of America uh, redeveloped a vacant building um, using a grant from HUD under our assisted living conversion program, which is um, a kind of part of the family of uh, uh, grant programs under uh, Section 202 for Elderly and, and 811. Um, and uh, that grant enabled them to convert this uh, vacant building to an assisted living uh, facility for residents with developmental uh, disabilities uh, that will provide very rich services to the residents is extremely energy efficient, uh, very high quality uh, design and professional uh, management, and you know, just a fabulous location that will really offer um, alternative to institutional setting uh, living. And so that's uh, what this uh, conversion program uh, is all about. But 
Another example I want to mention, and, and I'm particularly proud of it, partly because it's in my adopted hometown of San Francisco, uh, where I spent uh, many years uh, working for a nonprofit uh, organization, running a nonprofit organization that developed uh, and owned and managed affordable housing, uh, including Section 811. Uh, so I have a, a deep familiarity with the program from um, all sides of the uh, fence, and it's great uh, uh, to be able to come to HUD and actually uh, take the real world in the trenches experience of what it's like to own, manage, uh, deal with HUD uh, and its regulations and be on the other side and uh, trying to use that experience to, again, modernize and um, uh, grow uh, the program. But uh, the, the, the uh, sample, the example, the project I want to tell you about is um, called Mercy Arc Housing. Uh, and what's so fabulous about this is it is uh, using 811 funds um, under new authority we have under the Melville Act, uh, which passed about a year ago, uh, December, uh, thanks to lots of uh, support and drive uh, by, I'm sure, all of you in this room. Thank you very much for uh, enabling us to have this kind of uh, partnership. So the Mercy Arc Housing in San Francisco will fund 14 uh, apartments within a larger apartment complex, affordable housing complex that's being developed with the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program and uh, other sources of funding. So it will integrate 811 housing into a larger uh, community uh, apartment uh, complex, again, in a emerging uh, fabulous location uh, in San Francisco that is um, nearby, by just a couple of blocks, the um, the San Francisco Arc uh, Center, uh, where there's you know a, a rich array of services both at the property but uh, also uh, uh, very nearby. So uh, again, these are the kinds of evolution uh, of the 811 program that uh, we are fostering at HUD, really combining uh, access to supportive services uh, with housing is a is a very high priority for us, and doing that in a way that works uh, for the community, and that's why we have a great partnership uh, here under the Obama administration with the Department of uh, Health and Human Services. Uh, our secretaries enjoy a very close uh, working relationship. Uh, the staffs uh, enjoy a good working relationship. And we've actually formed a partnership um, called the HUD HHS Community Living Initiative. And uh, we, we're bringing together staff on a regular basis and working to facilitate uh, the barriers uh, by our different uh, programs and funding streams. And I just want to pause and say, you know, part of this is um, it's just a challenge given you have different statutory authority for housing programs, you have different statutory authority for medical services, and um, they don't always mesh perfectly, but HUD and HHS can't by ourselves just wave a magic wand and change those statutory authorities. We also deal with um, separate budgetary subcommittees within Congress. And uh, so, you know, Medicaid dollars get funded uh, through one committee, housing dollars through another committee, and getting, um, you might want to talk to the OMB person who's going to talk to you uh, later, getting the federal government to see the benefit of uh, housing people in less institutional settings um, uh, and the value of that to the overall federal budget um, you know, makes common sense, I'm sure, to all of us in this room, but, you know, getting all those various statutory funding streams to mesh uh, is just not as um, easy as it, as it sounds, but we are working very, very hard uh, to, to break down those barriers and do everything uh, that, that we can, and we look to groups like yourself, like ARC, uh, for inspiration and, and push, uh, and uh, telling us, you know, how we can make these uh, things work better. And so I just want to uh, take one more minute, uh, and then I do want to uh, take questions and have um, a dialogue here, but 
I do want to take one more minute and talk a little more specifically about uh, the authority we got under the Melville uh, Act and um, what we're doing to implement uh, implement that act because I think uh, this is the future of uh, where the 811 program uh, is going and so uh, I, I want you know all of you to uh, understand that but also give us feedback as we're um, going through that implementation process so that you know uh, we can be sure that we're getting it right because you're the guys who uh, work on this every day so um, under uh, under the Melville Act um, we are creating um, something called I have to just say the federal government is full of acronyms, uh, but um, emblaze this one in your memory. It's called PRAD, and it stands for Project Rental Assistance Demonstration Program. Um, and while it's a small program in dollars um, compared to some of HUD's other investments, um, I really do think it's one of the most remarkable things we're doing at HUD and in our partnership uh, with HHS. And so under this program, HUD will provide funding uh, directly to state housing agencies uh, when they agree to form partnerships with the state Medicaid and human services agency in their state. Um, the health care agency's involvement will ensure that the funds are targeted to the priorities of that state. Uh, and the state housing agency's um, involvement will mean that the Section 811 funding um, uh, that can be used that will be used for operating assistance so that's getting those rent levels down uh, as low as possible um, not not the traditional 811 uh, capital uh, that th that may, many of you may be familiar with because in this way what we'll do is the state housing agencies will access their other forms of capital low income housing tax credit home dollars through hud cdbg local redevelopment dollars uh, that kind of capital and then they'll marry um, the 811 operating subsidy with that and again be able to do even more streamlessly and more cost effectively the kind of development that I mentioned in San Francisco through the, uh, the Mercy Arc uh, project where again you'll have operating capital uh, yeah operating uh, assistance married with state um, funding for the capital and and we'll be able to do more uh, units uh, that way and more cost effectively and um, and and bottom line I think in terms of the of evolution of practice here is um, have them have the ability to be integrated into other um, community living uh, situations so we're very excited about that Um, and I just want to say, um, I can tell by the applause there's excitement about that, but another measure of excitement is that um, we had a, a webinar uh, to talk about, uh, you know, rolling this out and our, uh, our thoughts around it. And we had 400 participants um, participating in that uh, webinar. So we are, um, and we jointly hosted that with HHS. So I think it's a great uh, symbol of uh, the excitement out there uh, to get these models uh, scaled up and um, uh, really working effectively uh, in communities. So um, we're going to have um, $75 million uh, available this year, which uh, we think, again, because of the efficiency and leverage with uh, state capital, um, should be able to assist us in providing 2,500 to 3,000 uh, new affordable uh, apartments uh, for people with uh, disabilities. So I think that's uh, some great progress uh, that we can make, um, particularly in this very fiscally austere uh, budget environment that we live in. Um, we've got to find every way we can to stretch uh, every federal government dollar uh, that's, that's made uh, available. So uh, one other thing I just want to mention before I open it up is um, uh, another Pro HUD program related to the community uh, living uh, initiative is the uh, issuance of housing vouchers uh, specifically targeted to non-elderly uh, uh, pe people with disabilities uh, and a portion of which are set aside for residents seeking specifically to transition out 
of um, more institutional living situations into community living situations. And since 2010, HUD's issued more than 5,000 of these um, uh, particular vouchers to local housing authorities uh, with supplemental uh, programs uh, already in place, such as um, the CMS initiative, Money Follows the Person. And I know you're going to hear this afternoon uh, or, or have a panel with Cindy Mann uh, uh, over at CMS, and she and her team are just doing uh, great work uh, on this. And um, I think it, it has uh, a lot of promise uh, for uh, being, um, again, uh, an ongoing uh, model for integration um, of persons with disabilities into the uh, community. And um, uh, CMS also has provided um, grants through their um, CMS Real Choice uh, Systems Program to get states to, to you know, adopt and um, have best practices uh, around this as well. And so, uh, again, all of that, uh, I think, will mesh very well with the goals of HUD uh, for the PRAD program. Remember, and blaze PRAD on your brain. Um, as, you know, again, part of uh, a long-term strategy um, uh, at this administration for, uh, again, going back to our basic goal of utilizing housing as a platform for improving the quality of life. Uh, we think all of this moves in that direction, and uh, it's, it's very exciting work, and uh, it's, it's uh, wonderful uh, that all of you uh, are engaged uh, in, in not, obviously not just the housing piece, but, but all of this work, and I, I can't thank you enough uh, for that, and i uh, be happy to uh, answer any questions or uh, take any comments that you might have. So thank you. Thank you for having me here. Um, Could you identify yourself when oh, you're hi, where yeah, you're I'm, uh, My name's Erin Hall. I'm from Fort Worth, Texas. And I wanted to ask a question specifically about the UD part of HUD. Uh -huh. um, what, I, I used to work in child welfare, and um, several agencies I worked for partnered with local HUDs, local HUD officials, and um, and got access to community centers um, and properties like that that uh, that we wouldn't have been able to afford before, and we were able to serve, you know, triple triple the number of individuals pretty much overnight. What would be the? How would we go about trying to develop some kind of partnership like that? I mean, for instance, our community would benefit greatly. We experienced massive cuts and devastating cuts in our last legislative session in Texas. And, and if we had a community center where more individuals could come for classes and just to get out of the house and, um, and just be less at risk for abuse and neglect and depression and all of that terrible stuff and stay above the radar while their services have been slashed, I mean, that would serve a lot of, seems like it would be a great bang for the buck. Great. Uh, good question. So uh, for those of you uh, who don't know all the um, uh, federal government parlance, UD is urban development. So we are the Department of Housing and Urban Development, which I have to say is a little uh, controversial in this day and age because the fact is it's housing and community development and there are small towns and rural areas. Uh, it's not all uh, urban communities that uh, HUD is focused on. So um, I just want to make that clear. But um, uh, HUD does partner uh, really with communities through the Community Development Block Grant uh, program, for example. Again, the, the, all federal government domestic spending uh, projects are under fiscal pressure, and uh, CDBG is no uh, exception, but it is. Um, uh, the administration is continuing to fight to get communities, community development block grant dollars, for example. Those are the dollars that HUD really has for communities to uh, build community centers or, um, you know, maintain community centers. And so it, it, it really is working with your local officials uh, under where they're spending their federal community development uh, dollars, I think, would be the uh, place you would need to go there. Now, there are... Uh, HUD field offices, uh, including one uh, in um, uh, Fort Worth, um, and uh, the community development representatives there, I'm sure, uh, would be able to connect you with. Great. Yeah, right here. Good morning. I'm Good Steve morning. Larson with the ARC Minnesota. 
And, uh, I can hear the accent. <laughs> In soda. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's one of the great things about this job that, you know, I, 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 I now can understand Southern drawl. That was uh, very difficult for me uh, prior to my uh, tenure with the federal government. So, anyway. I won't speak with the Southern drawl, though. Okay. <laughs> we have a program uh, called Housing Access Services, and it works very closely with the Housing Voucher Program. Currently, it's state funded, but it, on, starting on July 1st, it will be funded through the waiver. And this is a program that has helped in the past two years, 360 individuals uh, move into homes of their own or uh, the, the requirement is their name has to be on the lease or they have to own it. Uh, and these are individuals, 70 of whom have come out of institutional type placements, others have been homeless, come out of nursing homes, come out of their parents' home, avoided going into group homes or any kind of congregate living situations. And what we found is that uh, the program has the flexibility of some transition dollars, which includes a damage deposit as well as buying some furniture, and we work with a lot of different nonprofits on that. Without uh, dedicated staff, uh, work with individuals to find the housing, uh, get their name on the lease, uh, and get the resources they need to be successful. And plus, there's a requirement that there can be no more density than 7% of persons with disabilities. So it's truly integrated housing that they're getting into. Right. So we just want to share <laughs> that it's great to have the housing vouchers, and I'm glad to hear that. But then you need dedicated staff that are housing experts to work with individuals to find that housing and break down some of those barriers that have existed to get into housing of their own. Thank you, thank you. Um, and um, we, we do understand that um, these uh, new models, uh, you know, bring new challenges to, and, and staffing uh, certainly is, uh, is one of those aspects. We I get that. Other questions or thoughts? Yeah, right here. Uh, my name is Dr. Glenn Matol, and I'm the CEO of the ARC San Francisco. So okay. thank you very much. <laughs> For the plug. <laughs> uh, I want to encourage you to continue to support uh, partnerships like the Mercy Arc. Prior to coming to the Arc, I was with Catholic Charities CYO and did about nine projects with a housing developer like Mercy. And the combination of the supportive service provider like the Arc combined with the housing developer makes for an awesome partnership. So proven, tested, and worthy of more investment. So please continue to support that and thank you. Great, well thank you for that comment and um, you know, as you may know, I have similar uh, a background and I, I totally believe in the partnership between um, the housing uh, development community, nonprofit community in particular, uh, and service providers. I think it's very hard for um, housing developers, owners, managers to be experts in uh, services or um, you know other other things and it's very hard for people who know the service side to uh, become an expert in uh, funding and uh, financial uh, understanding of some of the complexities of the housing subsidy world and so really uh, partnerships um, I think are absolutely uh, a preferred um, model uh, because it, it's hard to be good at, at both and uh, you need to find partners uh, that you know complement uh, each other so I, uh, I am t totally with that and that is when you see um, both our 202 uh, for elderly uh, program and um, the 811 program if you look at our NOFA our notice of funding availability uh, we are uh, most definitely driving in that direction in terms of uh, the priorities for funding and in terms of the expertise that we're uh, uh, looking for um, uh, as part of the application process yeah right here um, Sandra Gamro from NYSAR the PRAG program sounds very exciting however 2,500 to 3,000 new residential opportunities for people are not very large state nationwide. Right. Is this program, since it's a demonstration program, is this program open to every state or are you opening it only to certain states? Great, great question. So um, there will be a, a process where the states uh, will uh, need to apply essentially to use this authority. So not all 50 states 
uh, you know, it's not going to be a formula-based uh, program, so there will be a competition, and not all states will be eligible, um, partly because uh, it's, you know, not uh, enough money if you spread it around like peanut butter, uh, but um, also because, uh, frankly, not all states are uh, ready for it, that, you know, we are really looking for states that um, have been working on these kinds of partnerships between state housing agencies and uh, state human services uh, agencies, and either you know uh, have are well along in the process of having those uh, partnerships uh, working. And there are a number of states where uh, you know that that is the case. So I, I should say. Um, you know, this is a demonstration program. There are other, you know, traditional 811 dollars uh, available. Uh, this is something we want to, you know, test and um, and encourage. Uh, but again, we can't um, require. We don't want to require everybody to adopt it. One, there's not enough money, and 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 two, not everybody uh, is is ready for it. I, I would say, just also in general, the 811 program is a relatively small uh, federal housing program to start with. Um, but um, one of the very, very few that is continuing to be funded in this very tough fiscal environment that actually produces new housing. So one of uh, HUD's other priorities, given how uh, restrictive our you know, federal budget is right now, is to first and foremost ensure that we continue to fund the voucher program where people are already have the vouchers and already um, uh, using them and project-based Section 8 where people already are living in project-based housing or the existing operating subsidy for the 202 and the 811 uh, participants. And the fact is that those ongoing rental assistance programs uh, account for over 75 percent of HUD's budget. So the pot that we can use for new housing or new community development dollars or home dollars is only 25% of our entire uh, uh, HUD budget. And um, so I just put that in context that actually on a proportional basis, um, because of the work that you all did uh, in the Melville Act and with Congress, um, I think, uh, frankly, there's a, um, uh, don't quote me on this, but you know, a, a disproportionately large share of uh, money going into these new units, um, and and I think that's fabulous. Uh, that you know, we've this administration has continued that commitment to new housing uh, for people with disabilities, even in a, a time when, uh, frankly, um, other new construction programs uh, are are being cut back. Yeah. Dave Richard, I'm with the ARC in North Carolina, and we've been using HUD uh, a long time in 202 and 811s. A lot of it for traditional group homes that, as, as we're changing our state system, we'd like to find ways to transition out of what we have. And I guess the question is, are there things that you guys are thinking about that would help uh, states and organizations that have done that move out of where we were for the, the housing that's very old? So I don't know if everybody heard that question. It's a great question. Um, the moving. Um, someone who uh, owns some of the smaller group homes that uh, were funded with 811 or 202 uh, dollars, uh, moving away from that model. Um, I, I would say this, we are aware that this is a growing issue and concern. Um, we don't have a silver bullet for it at this point, but it is something, uh, and I've got my colleague Brendan uh, McTaggart here, um, something we will definitely be looking at now that we've got uh, the, the new model rolling out. We've got to go back. Um, we also have uh, just many, many, uh, one of the other things I really like about the integrated model it, as a housing developer from an operational standpoint um, is you've got an economies of scale uh, to own and maintain that property that you don't have when you have very, very small. Now, you know, some, I'm not saying that all very small properties don't make sense. In some cases they, they do, but um, it is harder to get the economies of scale to own and, and manage them. And we're finding some of the older um, properties, uh, you know, really, really struggling with the amount of assistance um, that they get. And so uh, we, we've got to tackle that uh, problem. I don't have the answer for it today, though. Right here, and then I'll take one more after this, and I'm going to have to cut out of here. Hi, my name is Carol Freedom from the ARC Maryland. Mm -hmm. 
And um, I, I was a little confused, or maybe I'm not confused, I just wanted some clarification that the project, the assisted living project in Northern Virginia, is that just for people with uh, developmental disabilities, or is that sort of a, a, a program that's for the, the general community, including people with developmental disabilities? So I'm going to let Brendan answer that. The assisted living conversion program is open to a larger community, including uh, seniors. But this particular project is designated for people with developmental disabilities. So everybody in this project? That, that is the word that we got from the people that, um, <laughs> that, that are on the project. So, so I don't know if everybody heard that, but the question is whether you know, it's for um, uh, people only with developmentally disabil developmental disabilities or a broader population. And again, the, the, you, you can use the assisted living conversion program to do a broad population, seniors, people with disabilities, uh, but I think this particular sponsor has chosen uh, not to do that, which I see quizzical looks, but we can, you can talk to Brendan about that afterwards. Anybody else? One more right there. Hi, um, Bruce Ulick, uh, Ark of Philadelphia. Um, how That's my I real know? hometown, actually. <laughs> Come back anytime. Brother, brotherly love and sisterly affection. Um, <laughs> Since HUD has taken over the Philadelphia Housing Authority and appointed a federal officer to oversee operations, and they're looking to recoup, recoup substantial millions of dollars, what is the strategy of returning it to local? Um, is there a timetable to return it to local control, or does the, HUD the, plan on staying there for a while? Yes, yeah, so, you know, I can't really uh, answer that because uh, public housing, uh, Public Housing Division is not under my um, purview. I do know that, um, I guess the good news is uh, the um, uh, board member uh, from HUD that was selected to kind of oversee this is Estelle Richmond, who uh, is you know, from Philadelphia and uh, has long time community ties. They're also around the state of Pennsylvania. Um, Health and Human Services Agency, I believe. So, you know, has some, it, you know, it's got some really good um, skill sets to be helping uh, in that transition. But I, I will just say, in general, uh, it is not never HUD's desire to, you know, control local housing authorities on a on an ongoing basis. Um, I know there have been a number of transitions uh, that I've seen happen since uh, since I've been in HUD, where you know there was a intervention, but uh, then a return to local um, local control. So I'm I just don't know the timetable for that in Philadelphia. Okay. Well, thank you all very much, and enjoy the rest of your day. It sounds like a great agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carol. Um, so I think we're off to a good start, and we are ready for our next speaker. As I told you, one of the offices I sit in is the Domestic Policy Council here at the White House, and many of you all probably know or have heard of or have worked with uh, Melody Barnes, who was our initial do Domestic Policy Council director here in the DPC um, and set an incredibly high standard uh, for what we do here at the DPC in the White House. And uh, Melody worked on the Hill for uh, Senator Kennedy and, and so has a long relationship with the disability community. And, uh, but if there's one person who I think can uh, take what Melody did and continue to build upon it and expand upon it, it's our new DPC director. Um, and I'm just thrilled to be uh, working in her office and working with her. And so please give a warm welcome to Cecilia Munoz. Thank you, Kareem. Good morning, everybody. How are you all? It's good to see you. It's very exciting to see you. I'm really, um, I'm really thrilled to have the opportunity to welcome you all here this morning. Um, uh, and I really should start by thanking Kareem, who does such incredible work for us. I've had the honor of working for him, with him for three years now. I'm new to this role, but not new to the White House. And um, I'll tell you what, he is an incredibly strong voice and mind and presence in this building, and we rely on him for a lot. So. Um, uh, I owe him a lot myself, so just thank you, Kareem, for everything you do here and for keeping me on track, among many other things. Um, and thanks to all of you for coming from all over the country uh, to spend time with us. I know we have a very packed agenda for you today, but I wanted to make sure that I took advantage of the opportunity to just introduce myself and make sure that we get to know each other a little bit. Um, I am new to the Domestic Policy Council. I've been at it for almost exactly a month. Um, 
But I'm not new to the White House. I started the day after the inauguration as um, the Director of Intergovernmental Affairs for the President, which means that I managed uh, all of his relationships with state, local, tribal, territorial governments. Um, and I came to that role after 20 years at an organization called the National Council of La Raza, which is a Latino civil rights organization, where, and I know some of you from my days there, in fact, I know the ARC from my days there. Um, I directed the public policy shop there. I was there for 20 years, and my area of expertise is immigration policy, but we were a civil rights organization and worked on a whole range of issues um, that you are familiar with. And one of the, um, I would say, biggest challenges of my career there um, is, and one of the issues that I am proudest of having worked on, is the issue around which I came to know your organization. Um, and that is, for those of you who were around in the mid-90s when the welfare reform passed, um, it included a retroactive cut in access to federally funded services to immigrants who are in the country legally. Um, and by making it retroactive, it meant that all kinds of people who are on SSI and Medicaid um, were going to lose access to that coverage. And in fact, the law passed. Folks started getting letters saying that for many of them, what was really their only source of support or access to care was going to be cut off. And in the work that we had done leading up to that law, those of us who are advocates in the immigrants' rights community uh, felt a little isolated and a little alone, and we weren't sure that everybody else, uh, anybody, that anybody else understood what this would mean. Um, and I learned that I was wrong. And the first organization that made it clear that I was wrong was the ARC, because you all understood. Um, and we did together, with a lot of other people, what everybody in town said was impossible. And that, right, this law passed. We, we all understood it was devastating. Uh, and we rolled up our sleeves and said, we're not going to let this happen to people. Um, and we formed a coalition. We met several times a week in our offices. And frankly, your organization really led the charge and helped um, make it personal and real and understood what this meant, would mean to real fellow human beings all around the country. Um, and as a result of that, before anybody lost a nickel in services, we were able to reinstate services for the people who had been at the, in the country at the time that the law was passed. Um, it was a huge accomplishment. It was against the odds. It was one of those things where all of Washington, D.C. told us it couldn't be done. Um, we did that together. But frankly, you did that. And um, I will always be grateful for that experience. Um, it was a, you know, one victories against the odds are sweet things. Um, they're less sweet when what you're doing is trying to undo a great injustice. But it is what it is, right? And I learned a great deal about the power of this organization, about the power of telling a story in human terms. Um, and I'll never forget it. So I wanted you to know that. And this is part of the reason I wanted to be here this morning, is because that work is so important. And the work that you do is so <laughs> vital. So I know a lot of you uh, know and love Melody Barnes. I, I love her too, and we miss her dearly. Um, and it is not a small matter to be trying to fill her shoes. Um, but I know of her deep commitment to the issues that you work on, and I share it. Um, and I also know that, that you love and miss, as we do, Jeff Crowley, who is um, also a strong advocate um, on these issues. Uh, we miss him too. But I'll tell you what, um, our secret weapon, collectively, is Kareem Dale. Um, and I have learned over the last three years that if I'm doing what Cream says I should do, then I think I'm in pretty good shape. So um, the fact that we get to work together on this team for me is a great privilege, and I'm really looking forward to it. So the point of today, uh, the point of this br briefing is, um, is twofold. We want to make sure we're giving you information you need to do your jobs well, but we also want to make sure that we're listening. Uh, I learned the power of the, st of the stories that you have to tell as well as the policy issues that you are focused on. Um, but in some ways, it's the stories. It's making it real and visible and human that helps drive the policy, helps drive the power behind the policy. Um, your leadership last year helped us understand how incredibly important the Medicaid program is in providing the supports and services that people need all around the country. The stories you told to my colleagues, Phil Shalero and John Carson, were extremely meaningful, and I want you to know how much that um, strengthens our ability to do the work. Again, it makes it, we understand the policy issues, we can you know, read statistics, we all understand um, the metrics of how this stuff works, and the metrics are important. 
but it also has to be real uh, in people's hearts uh, in order for us to be as effective as possible collectively. Um, and so your contributions to doing that has, have really been meaningful in this building, and I want to make sure that you hear that, and that's part of the reason that, uh, that we asked you to come today. Um, so you're going to be hearing about a variety of initiatives and policies that we're working on. You're going to meet with folks from the Department of Justice, from CMS, from HUD, from OMB, uh, and a variety of others during your breakout sessions. But I want to say as clearly as possible, this is not just about you hearing, it's about us hearing. So I know you won't be shy because I've worked with you. Um, but I encourage you not to be shy because I, I just, I can't tell you how important that is. And the power of us being able to say, well, look, we were just in a meeting with folks and this is what they set us on fire about. This is what they're on fire about. The power of that really helps us advance the cause. And so um, we appreciate it enormously. You heard, if you heard the President's State of the Union address, this notion of bringing our country back to our strongest values, of this notion that if everybody does their fair share, they should get a fair shot, and they should be able to have access to the American dream and the ability to, to uh, fulfill their, their greatest potential. Um, the fair shot piece is very real for us, uh, and it's very real for us in that it applies to every American in this country. And there, we have work to do to make sure that it's real for every American. And we take that incredibly seriously. That is what the president stands for. He believes that that's what's most consistent with our values as a nation, with who we are. But it is not altruism. This is what's vital for our country to be who we are, but also to, to, to go into the future. This is an economic necessity. We don't want to leave any resource on the table. There is so much potential with the energy and talent and drive of the people of this country. And our commitment is to make sure that we provide what's necessary as a society to make sure that everybody can do what's theirs to do. Um, and if, if the, really, the fundamental question, whether it's with respect to education, employment, health coverage, transportation, of, or any one of a number of other issues, we understand we have some choices to make as a country and as a society. Are we going to be the country that provides supports and services so that everybody has a chance to excel? Or are we going to be a country that makes the choice to leave folks behind? That choice is really clear to us here. I know it's very clear to you. This administration has made that choice, and that's the direction that we're trying to drive the country in, and we need your help to do it effectively. Um, so on, in education, we were just a uh, part of an announcement just yesterday with respect to how we're trying to drive the education debate forward. And it is, I spent a lot of time with Secretary Duncan, both in making this announcement, preparing the announcement, and, and engaging in the work. Um, we need to make sure students with disabilities are leaving school ready to enter college and be successful, period. <laughs> so when we announced these waivers in 10 states yesterday, among the metrics we were looking at in approving those waivers is what are these states doing with respect to students with disabilities? What are their accountability metric metrics? How can we make sure those accountability metrics make sense to actually measure what's going on? Um, and it's all about achieving the outcome. We're trying to be driven by making sure we achieve these really very important goals. Um, the, this is why the Administration on Developmental Disabilities is working closely with the Department of Education to plan the 2012 National Transition Conference. It's focused on college and career access for students with disabilities. We're trying to make sure we're being deliberate about this work. It's not just part of the whole package. It's something that we need to concentrate on. Um, so the ADD has invested nearly $5 million in projects to improve and develop post-secondary education programs for students with intellectual disabilities through the Think College Project and University Centers of Excellence in Development, de Developmental Disabilities, helping to support best practices, expand and, and may, may make sure we have as inclusive a budget uh, as possible with respect to creating higher education opportunities. In employment, it's incredibly important that we as a society choose to provide opportunities so that people with intellectual, developmental, and all sorts of disabilities have a fair shot to retain employment that provides a living wage. This is vital to our, just our success as a society. In, to, in uh, last year, the Administration on Developmental Disabilities awarded over $12 million over five years in grants to states working to increase competitive integrated employment outcomes for youth and young adults with deve developmental and intellectual disabilities, as well as the related data collection, technical assistance, and evaluation activities. This is about making sure we're measuring the success of this work, that we're investing in this work, but that we're measuring the outcomes. We need to make sure it's as impactful as possible. 
Um, so uh, this year, ADD is going to convene four summits, ensuring the opportunity in every state and territory in this country participates in developing a specific plan to enhance state and local self-advocacy efforts. Uh, if we don't provide the supports and services that people need so that people with disabilities can be independent and contribute to our society, we ultimately know it costs us all more in the long run, and it's just inconsistent with who we are. So I um, am honored to be part of the team um, implementing the President's vision in this area. Um, I feel like we're in this moment where we have um, incredible leadership that understands how important it is to make sure that, that we lift everybody up and provide opportunity to everyone in this country. Um, our job is to maximize what we accomplish in the time that we're here. And we understand in a fundamental way we can, that we can't do that without you. So that's why you're here. I know that's why you're here. I know that's why you do what you do every day. Um, I'm incredibly grateful, personally, that you've taken the time to be part of this effort today. We, collectively, are grateful for your expertise and your passion. Um, we want to make this day as useful as possible so that we can advance this work together. So thank you all very, very much for the, your good work every day. <clears throat> thank you very much, Cecilia, for coming over. We appreciate it. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's funny. You, I've worked in the White House since, uh, like like Cecilia, since day one, and also worked on the campaign. And the thing you, you know, you know the legends of the disability community, right? The Marty Fords, uh, uh, so many others. Uh, yes, Marty is a legend. <laughs> uh, so many people have worked on these issues for so long. And but you know, a lot of times. I'm always amazed when I work with, you know, I've worked with, with every office in this building on one initiative or another, and you go around and you talk to people, and then you realize, oh wow, that person has worked on disability. And the story that Cecilia just told about working with the ARC, when um, hearing that story and knowing that you know she had been in the fight at some point in time, you hear so many stories about that, and you just never know um, which person and what their story is, whether they have a personal connection uh, to disability, as so many people do, or whether they've been in the fight uh, at one point in time. And so, you know, as we, as we, as the president elevates leaders like Cecilia and puts her in different positions, I think that we all are just so extraordinarily fortunate uh, to have somebody like Cecilia leading the Domestic Policy Council now. And so it's, it's, a, it's a great thrill for me, because uh, every time, you know, when Melody is leaving, it's just like, oh my God. No more melody. I mean, she so gets it. Uh, but but uh, my heart is soaring now with Cecilia and leadership. So uh, let me let me turn to. Uh, I am back now to talk to you for a few minutes before we uh, before we go to break. So I want to talk to you about a few different areas. First, I want to talk to you a little bit about the White House tools that we have for you all to get involved and what those tools are and how you can continue to be involved. Uh, with the administration. I'm going to talk a little bit about of our employment policy. I'll, I'll take some questions, uh, then we'll take a break uh, before Cindy Mann starts up at, at about 9.30 this morning. So tools. Obviously, one of those tools is the Community Leaders Briefing. Uh, we, we have done 25 of these across the country. And what's, what's, what's great about this is that this is the first one uh, that we have done that is quote unquote disability only or disability specific. But in other ones, we've had people with disabilities participate as different groups have brought down uh, different on different initiatives. So obviously, that's what we're striving to do here at the White House is to make sure that disability is included in what we do uh, in the administration. So as you go back, I would encourage you all to not only tweet and Facebook about uh, this community's briefing. I saw a lot of great stories uh, that you all have generated in your local communities in North Carolina, and our communications department was like, what is going on with this ARC thing? I mean, we're getting calls from North Carolina and all over the country that some executive director is coming and has been invited to the White House. I mean, it, so the stories were pouring in fast and furious, and let me tell you, we are thrilled about that uh, because we want everybody in the country to know that we are engaging with people with disabilities and we're trying to listen to what you all think, what you all are telling us. So please continue to do that. Please also continue to look on our website for upcoming communities leaders briefing. If you see something that you're interested in, email us. Tell us about it. 
uh, email Marty or email us here at the White House and tell us about what you saw, what you think uh, we should be doing, or you want to get involved in a particular effort, because uh, that's the way that we're engaging. It's one of the ways we're engaging with, country, with uh, communities around the country. The other, another mechanism that we have is what's called Champions of Change. Have, have folks heard of Champions of Change? Yeah. No. Has anybody heard of it? Yeah. A few people? A few people? Okay. All right. Don't raise your hands because I can't see your hands. Uh, you know. <laughs> um, uh, but that's okay. For those of you who did, that's okay. It's all right. It's okay. It's a, it's a natural instinct, right? It's a natural instinct. But, um, and so Champions of Change is an, is an event that we do. Um, I don't know if it's every week, but it's, it's pretty frequently, where we bring in folks who are making a difference, who are champions of change in their various communities. So for example, we did a Champions of Change on emergency preparedness, and we had a fantastic young woman in here from New Jersey who does emergency preparedness and inclusiveness for folks with disabilities. And typically it's about 10 to 15 champions we bring in, and we highlight the work that they're doing in their local communities on a particular area, and that was emergency preparedness, and she was just phenomenal. And they got lots of local press stories for her as well for the work she had done, and we bring those folks in, honor them here, try to highlight and really stand up what they are doing, because we, we, we all understand that the real change does not come from here in the White House or here in Washington, D.C., uh, but it's folks like, you, folks like you all who are working on the ground every day. So you should check out our website. All of this can be found on winehouse.gov. Just look for Champions of Change, and you'll see where you can nominate people for different uh, events that are coming up. The one that is just closed was uh, we, we just had one closed for nominations for Let's Move, for the First Lady's initiative regarding staying active in childhood obesity. And so we got... I sent out the link to a lot of the, you know, about 80 or 100 people who I know who work on athletics and sports for kids with disabilities, and we got about, I don't know, we must have gotten about 200 entries or people suggesting, nominating different people who are doing great things in athletics or sports or fitness for people with disabilities. So you should check out that and make sure that you, when you see one that you like, or you see one that you know somebody who is a champion and they'll describe on there kind of some of the parameters or what we're looking for, nominate them, send it in. Then you can send me an email and say, hey, I nominated this person. Make sure you take a look at them. Um, we have a Champions of Change team who obviously looks at those, but I'm happy to look at any specific ones you nominate as well so that I can say, hey, this is something I think is really good. We should flag it. Uh, one of the ones that is coming up, and I think the deadline is fairly soon, is Champions of Change around the Affordable Care Act. I bet you all know some champions around uh, the Affordable Care Act implementation or some folks that are doing some really great things around the Affordable Care Act or benefiting from the Affordable Care Act. Uh, we had some of those folks, obviously, in uh, from the ARC and other organizations last year. And also, we've had periodic folks come in who talk about you know, pre-existing conditions and how they were able to uh, stay on their parents' insurance and so many other things. So you should check out that link for the Affordable Care Act Champions of Change. And if you have nominations, make those nominations. It's, these are the ways that we're engaging with our communities. Some of the other ways that we're doing that in, in my world specifically is the, we do a uh, monthly disability call. What, let me back up and say, I almost hesitate to ask this because then I'm going to yell at Marty and Peter. I've said good things about this. I'm going to yell at them, though. How many of you all are on uh, my White House distribution list where we send out updates from the, it comes from like the White House Disability Group? Yes. 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 Lots of people? Okay. Okay. All right. Well, good, good, good. You all didn't even raise your hand that time. You're not. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, so we need to get, we need to make sure everybody is on that list so you can get updates. We send out updates all the time about great new things that are happening, whether it's things about the things I just talked about, Champions of Change. We sent out the great ARC press release for this event. Uh, yesterday, we send out announcements about what Department of Justice is doing on Olmstead or Department of Education, all of our administrations, what the president is doing. So you want to sign up for that list. There are two ways you can sign up. So let me give you those two ways, and you can write, write these down so you can make sure that you can sign up if you're not on the list. One way is you can go to whitehouse.gov, and on the front page, there's a link for disabilities. And you just click on that link and go to the contact us form, fill it out, and we automatically get that, and my team will add you all to our list. The other way is you can email us at uh, disability, just the word disability, at who.eop, for executive office of the president, dot gov. So that's disability at 
who.eop.gov and just let us know you want to be added to the distribution list. Give us your name and your organization, your city and stuff like that and we'll make sure to add you so you can get updates. One of the things that we send out as I was as I was getting ready to say is things about our monthly dis our monthly disability call. Have folks participated in our monthly disability call? Okay, a few people. Um, those are, I think those have been really beneficial, at least you all have said that they've been really beneficial, to hear from administration officials about what's going on, the latest information, and one of the things we're doing now is we did a, we did a, uh, a question on disability.gov for folks to identify the questions that you all were interested in, so we're going to be answering those questions in the upcoming months, and we've had, you know, we've had Secretary uh, Duncan on there, we've had Secretary Donovan on there, uh, we've had Mike Sharmanis, who is the chief of staff to Valerie Jarrett. Um, we've had some deputy secretaries, Deputy Secretary Seth Harris on there. We've had John Barry on the call. So we, we, we really try to bring you a wide array of folks. We've had many folks who are disability appointees who work in different areas in OSERS or in ODEP with Kathy Martinez. And we'll continue to do that. So you want to stay tuned and look out for those monthly disability calls. And we, of course, have a question and answer session at the end of each call to engage with you on to hear what's going on. So we're uh, very excited about those initiatives. So those are some of the ways that you all can get involved. There are other ways. I encourage you to check out our website on the disabilities link to hear about other ways that you can, um, you can get involved with us. Let me take a moment and talk a little bit about um, some of the things that we're doing on employment for folks with disabilities. You heard Cecilia talk about the, uh, the grant that ADD put out with regard to promoting inter, uh, integrated employment. So that's one of the things that ADD is doing and Sharon Lewis, um, I'm sure all of you all know and have, have harassed or yelled at at some point in time, um, is our leader over at ADD and is really doing a fantastic job of really pushing forward uh, progressive initiatives regarding employment for those with intellectual and developmental disabilities. But we're also doing a lot from a broad standpoint for all folks with disabilities. Obviously, we have the President's Executive Order related to employment of people with disabilities where we, the President set a goal for the administration to be a, uh, for the government to be a model employer of persons with disabilities. And we signed that back in uh, 2010 on the 20th anniversary and we're really hard at work. And it is difficult work, let me tell you. And if it, if it wasn't difficult, it probably already would have been done. But it's difficult work, um, not because I think, not because I think just people don't want to do it, right? But I think it's just changing mentalities, changing ideas, really building in accountability and responsibility and putting in place real mechanisms that work and so that people understand that this is good for your agency. This is not that hard if you build it into what you're doing as an agency. If you make sure that your HR people know about Schedule A, right? Because if you know about Schedule A, then you can hire people which also helps the HR persons in their other um, administration goals where they have to decrease the number of the amount of time from which a person applies to getting a job. So Schedule A, you, utilizing Schedule A is really something that we're pushing with the agencies where uh, each agency has put together a plan for hiring persons uh, with disabilities and we are going to be holding agencies feet to the fire about those plans and we are doing training sessions here in DC and across the country. We're going to be posting the numbers online uh, once they become available. Um, we're going to talk, we got to talk to the lawyers of course because the lawyers always have something to say about something. Uh, so we got to talk to the lawyers and make sure what we can, what we can put online but we're going to be doing that um, to the extent permitted by law. So um, we're excited about that and we're excited about the executive order. It's going to take a lot of work over the next uh, several years, but we're going to stick to it and we're going we're to stay focused on it. So um, another initiative that we have launched is the, uh, we just put out a rule on Section 503. Um, a notice of proposed rulemaking regarding the Rehab Act. So that, and this is, this is a game changer. Um, uh, and the proposed rule basically says that if you're a federal contractor, you're gonna have to have a goal of 7% of hiring persons with disabilities. So what the proposed rule says, obviously, it's gone through comment period, the comment period closes um, in, I think, February 21st now. Uh, we extended it for a couple of weeks and then we're gonna go into the final rulemaking process. But this is the game changer, saying that you know federal contractors need to be looking at hiring persons with disabilities. There have been goals for women and other minority groups and there's been a law for people with disabilities, but there's been no goal. Uh, there's been no numerical goal. There's been no real accountability. There's no, been no real reporting or responsibility. And so that's what this rule is seeking to do. And it was a goal of this administration. We came in the door and the Department of Labor, the Office of Federal Compliance, 
uh, OFCCP has been really diligent in moving this forward, and so we're very excited about that and the opportunities that it will provide for people with disabilities with federal contractors because they're going to have to be looking for people with disabilities to hire. And we say in there, you've got to be communicating with uh, local advocacy organizations like the ARC and like other organizations in their cities, Easter Shields, et cetera, et cetera. And you've got to be communicating with Voc Rehab. And you've got to be making sure that you're providing job notices to these organizations so that they can know what's going on and so that they can provide information. So we're excited about that rule. Um, folks should stay tuned for what's going on. And you know where you can hear more about that? Well, that's very good, but I was going to say also through, if you sign up for my distribution list, <laughs> whitehouse.gov, you got to go searching for stuff. If you're on my distribution list, you just get it right there. Uh, so, uh, so we have a number of initiatives. Let me, let me, let me stop right there uh, for a moment, and uh, let me open it up for questions if folks have questions either on employment or you can ask questions on other areas as well if there's a, if there's a you know, you're going to hear from, um, you, you know the areas where you're going to hear from folks. Um, so I'll let them address those areas, but if you have other specific questions on other areas, I'm happy to address those or preview some of the stuff that our other folks are going to say. Questions? Go ahead. Professor Kissing from Massachusetts. Uh, one of the big fair, by the way, say hi from Gary Blumenthal, a close colleague of mine. Okay. I know great. you guys know each other well. Yeah. Uh, one of the issues really around employment, but also in terms of successful community living for people with intellectual developmental disabilities you know, let alone all people with disabilities, is the education piece mm -hmm. growing up, right? And both before transition and especially around transition. So college stuff's good, you know, preparation for college is good, all that stuff's good. But what we find is, is a lack of accountability around safety skills, community travel skills, um, you know, working with families, because it's not just a school thing, but it clearly is a school thing, more independence around activities, community living, uh, daily living, and related things. So. It seems like here's a chance, you know, during those years to help kids achieve as much as possible. I know it's, a, it's something education worries about all kids, right. but clearly with kids with disabilities, and in Massachusetts it's supposed to be a progressive state, I can tell you there's not really great <coughs> accountability at the schools for these kinds of, you know, developments and these kinds of needs for skills to live in our fast-paced community. So right. Right. it's something we'd love for you to tackle, you know, in partnership, and uh, what do you think about that, and, you know, what have you heard about that? Well, listen, I, I think a couple of things. First of all, I, I, you know, one of the things that um, Cecilia just mentioned and that you can, you, you'll certainly be able to talk to Alexa about in the breakout session for those of you in there. Uh, we are going to be doing a national transition conference coming up next year, and I think some of the issues that you raise fall into that category. Obviously, not all of them. Some of those are transition, obviously, are just specifically related to, to education issues. Uh, but some of those issues are important than that because, you, 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 listen, if you don't have daily living uh, skills, if you don't have independent living skills, then it's hard to transition, and we know that those are critical. Um, and I, listen, I completely get that, and I think it's important that we, tr you know, we, we find a way for kids with disabilities to be ready uh, to not only transition to college from an educational standpoint, but that kids with disabilities are prepared from a social standpoint, from a living standpoint, from a, you know, balance your checkbook, from a uh, standpoint of social integration and cooking and maintaining a home. I mean, those things are really critical. Uh, I myself went to um, Tennessee School for the Blind, and one of the things that I was fortunate enough to receive there is a lot of these daily living skills. I mean, I, I've, I'm, I'm fortunate myself to have two fantastic parents who uh, taught me these skills anyway, but the school also did a great job of teaching me, you know, how to cook, and um, I can still cook. As a matter of fact, Sarah often begs me to uh, cook some things for her. But I, you know, I said, listen, I, it's, I, it's not my job to cook for you, Sarah. So, um, uh, but, but, th but those are very, very important skills uh, that kids with disabilities need to develop to be integrated into our society. So I think that we certainly are happy to have a conversation. Obviously, um, you know, I know if I talked to the Department of Education, there are, there are financial restraints and, and on resources, resources that are tight everywhere for everybody, uh, whether it's Voc Rehab, whether it's the, the Department of Education as a whole. Um, so I think we're certainly happy to engage in that conversation. Other questions? Mary Lee Mackery, hello, mm -hmm. from the ARC in D.C. Mm -hmm. uh, persons with disabilities who are unemployed is probably one of the largest minority groups in this country. You never hear much about that in the press. You never hear it around election time. I'm curious about your thoughts in 
promoting the voting aspect of this population to uh, become more empowered and to make a dent in how the administration sees that group? <laughs> well, you know, um, you ask a question that uh, <laughs> you, you got to be very careful, right? We have ethical restraints here about we, we are the administration. We obviously are not the campaign, so I'm, I'm not going to get into kind of voting uh, for the president or anything like that. But I think w what I will say is that obviously, uh, well, a couple of things. First of all, um, you are right that in terms of the national media, you certainly don't hear a lot about people with disabilities uh, as a segment in terms of employment. And what I tell people about that is, you know, we obviously can't control what the media says or what the media does. And what we what we try to do is have the president talk about it as much as we can. Um, and he obviously uh, is the president for all people. So he talks about America as a whole. Uh, but we've had him talk about people with disabilities quite a bit um, in open press events, you know, the 20th anniversary, the 19th anniversary of the ADA, the signing of the 21st Century Communications Act. If you listen to his remarks yesterday on education, uh, he talked about kids with disabilities or included kids with disabilities. So we make an effort and the president makes an effort to include people with disabilities uh, inclusive in his remarks and then separate making remarks. And that's what we're going to continue to do. And we think, you know, what we can do is continue to set an example and say that this is important to the president and that's what we talk about. This is important to the president. And so we think it should be important to the country as a whole. And that's what the president is going to continue to do. That's what his top advisors uh, Valerie Jarrett and, and the rest of our team, we're going to continue to do. We're going to continue to talk about people with disabilities and employment. Uh, in terms of just the broad overarching issue of voting, listen, obviously we believe that it doesn't matter whether you're Democrat or Republican or Independent or whatever you are, uh, we believe, this is America. We believe that people have a right to vote and should, should be voting. And we believe that those, that voting should be accessible uh, for people with disabilities and should be open and accessible for all um, to, to, to exercise that fundamental right. And so I think that uh, when you look at the work that our, that our Civil Rights Division uh, and the Department of Justice has done on some new initiatives around voting and access, I think that they're working hard on that. Um, through a number of different initiatives, whether it's their project to civic access initiative where they're saying cities and states have to have all of their facilities and all of their uh, things that are available to the public open and accessible. And so um, we also fought pretty hard to keep funding in there for the, uh, for, the EE, for the EAC and to make sure that they still had funds so that they could, um, uh, that they could look at accessible voting. So well, we're focused on those issues. Other questions? Mac Ramsey from the uh, Park of Prince George's County, right across the Anacostia here. Yeah. Um, I was interested in, have you employed people here in the White House with intellectual disability? And if so, what your experience has been? And if not, could the local chapters here of the ARC help you do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> Um, to, to my knowledge, and I say that, to my knowledge, we have not employed a person with an intellectual or developmental disability here in the White House. And you know who else talks to us about this? I mean, I, uh, Maria Shriver has talked to us about this. Tim Shriver has talked to us about this and said, when are y'all going to do this? And, it's not hard. We'll make it happen. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's, uh, we, we certainly are happy to hear about you. I mean, the thing about the White House is that it is, it is just... It's extraordinarily difficult. The positions are very limited. There's a limited number of positions. So, um, you know, I don't do the hiring for the, for, for the White House. And so, but we are happy to look at considerations for candidates, for positions. We can put you in touch with the kind of the department that does that. We have a, we have a very small department that does that here at the White House. But for the most part, departments hire their own, they hire their own people for the most part with, with kind of consulting from, uh, the, the personnel shop. So, but we're happy to talk about candidates and positions you all think uh, we're available. We're certainly happy to talk about that. You know, and just in terms of obviously one of the things that we have done as administration in looking at hiring people with intellectual and developmental disabilities is our commitment and expansion of Project Search. Um, we started off, I think, with one agency, and now it's up to, I think, four or five agencies here in D.C. where we're bringing high school students in at the Department of Education, uh, Department of Interior, HHS, uh, Labor, and maybe one other that I'm missing. Um, and those 
internships for those high school seniors with intellectual and developmental disabilities have turned into uh, full-time permanent employment in quite a few cases, both here in the federal government and also uh, where they've gone on to get uh, a competitive integrated employment uh, in other private businesses. So our commitment to, to programs like Project Search are ongoing and we're, we're really working with agencies to try to expand that uh, and keep pushing on that. And you know, Secretary Duncan and I have spoken at a couple of the graduations uh, for Project Search and it's something that we're, we're, we're very proud of. Um, let's see. What, uh, I don't know, Sarah, Sarah will tell me when, I'm, when we need to take a break, but let me take another question. My name is Don Raub from the ARC of Carroll County here in uh, Maryland. Um, and first of all, thank you for, you know, just the efforts that you've made in employment and housing. It's, it's really um, great to hear the progress. One of the um, areas I don't hear a lot about is um, in many of our states, we continue to have institutions that house people. And I'm just curious as to what the administration's vision and perhaps strategies um, are to eliminate um, or certainly reduce the uh, people living in institutions. Well, you know, <laughs> we've got one of the best speakers on that uh, coming up, Tom Perez. He is, he is going to, he's going to wow you all. Um, he is, first of all, he's a phenomenal speaker. He's, he's a lawyer, so he's, he's, he's pretty good on his feet. Uh, but he is unbelievably passionate. I first met Tom, um, many of you probably know him from, from a long time ago when he's done other, worked in other battles with the disability community. But I first met him in the transition when we were, um, he was heading up some of the agency reviews and, and got to know him then and worked very closely with him here at the Department of Justice. So Tom will really talk to you about what we're doing uh, with regarding uh, making sure that people with disabilities can live in the communities where they choose. But you know, that has been one of our most important and I think most impressive accomplishments related to people with disabilities. The Olmstead enforcement has been just phenomenal uh, from the Georgia settlement to the Delaware settlement to the most recent Virginia settlement, which is an absolute uh, landmark settlement. Um, to give, to give folks with disabilities a chance to live in the community. I mean, those settlements are groundbreaking and historical. And I think you'll hear from Tom that they're just getting warmed up. And so um, there, is, there is a full steam ahead to continue to work on this issue and to continue to drive forward. So um, I, I, I would say that, number one, um, you should be hearing about what we're doing. Um, so hopefully you'll be on my distribution list where you'll see the <laughs> myriad of announcements I send out about our Olmstead settlements and the fact that we've engaged in over uh, some like 40 or 50 different litigations around the country and all of these landmark settlements and you'll be able to hear when Tom, uh, Tom has joined me on a couple of our monthly calls and probably will join me on another one to talk about Virginia. So you should be hearing about it, and that's, that's our fault that you haven't heard about it. And I want to be clear about something. You know, you're going to hear a lot about what we've done, but I want to be clear, but we have not done enough. We are not satisfied with where we are. We simply, there's a lot more work to do. There are still people struggling. There are still people um, uh, who can't get jobs, who don't get the education, who can't live in the community. We, we are simply not resting on our laurels. We are not satisfied with where we are. We are going to keep pushing, and, you know, in this... DC environment, which I'm from Chicago, so this whole DC thing is new to me. Where you know we're supposed to spend the next eight months not doing anything uh, while waiting for the election. Well, I don't know about you all, but folks can't just wait for the next eight months while we sit by and twiddle our thumbs. Um, so, so the so the president has told us and has told us personally. Uh, listen, there's no breaks over the next eight months. Let's get busy and let's get to work. And uh, he, he gave that message to his, to his entire team uh, just a couple of weeks ago that we're, we're not going to sit around and wait. We're going to do what we can legislatively, but if we can't get it done legislatively, we're going to get it done through um, the executive branch. So I just want to be clear as you hear about some of our accomplishments and you hear about some of the looking forward, we are, we are full steam ahead. Um, okay. How are we doing on time, Sarah? It's break time. Well, let's, let's take one more question. Yes. Clay Boatwright from Arca, Texas. Hey. Um, I understand that the administration, you're doing a seven-city tour um, across the country, and I think, as, as a matter of fact, coming to Austin at the end of March. I was wondering, can you give us some color around what the, those White House meetings are in those cities and kind of what the plan is around that? I'm not sure why I took one more question. I should have just listened to Sarah. <laughs> should have just listened to Sarah. Well, let, let me... Uh, let, 
<laughs> Always. Let me, let me just back up and say that um, d despite the media reports to the contrary, what, what we've talked about is, what we've talked about is tentatively, tentatively, let me, let me say that word, tentatively, trying to look at engaging with people with disabilities around the country. And we had identified some tentative cities that we were looking at, some tentative dates, but those, nothing of, none of that is final. And we're trying to figure out, you know, what's the best way to engage with people around the country where we can get to the most people with disabilities, where the most people with disabilities can ask questions of the administration, of senior people in the administration, and the best way to engage with you all. So I think if we, dis if we move forward with the cities in Austin and the other cities that, that folks have probably seen in different media reports, we certainly will engage with you all. Um, but, but the goal is to not only talk about the accomplishments and how the administration is collaborating, but to talk with people with disabilities, uh, family members and advocates about what can we be doing. It is, we, we're not interested in talking at people, um, we're interested in working with people. And so that will be the focus of kind of whatever we do, is to sit down and have an exchange, have a dialogue in different settings and different formats about where we are and where we need to go as a country related to all people with disabilities, all right? So thank you all. Um, let's take a break and um, kind of feel, feel free to mingle in here and talk. We'll start up around 9.30. I think there's water out there that the ARC provided.